I will be forever the myth. You're the king of kings, <laughs> There's always a pecking order. The little peckers never mess with the big peckers. So I'm a rooster, and he's a chicken for the week. All right, welcome back to the Bodybuilding Legends podcast, and my special guest this week is Mr. John Little, and John was our guest uh, about a year ago, and it was one of our most popular interviews, and we had him on to talk about Mike Menser, who John knew as a close friend, and since we're just uh, going over the anniversary death of Mike, who who died on uh, June 10th, uh, 2001, I thought we would bring John back and talk again more about Mike Menser. John, welcome to the show. Thanks, John. Always great to speak to you. Same here. Uh, yeah. And I've got to say, too, right off the top, that uh, I, uh, one of the things I really like about your podcast as a viewer is, A, the caliber of guests, like the bodybuilders that you have. Like you yeah. recently had Danny Padilla. And yeah, that was great. You've had, you've had Chris Dickerson and Boyer Co. and down the list. And... Each one of them sort of bring for me uh, a different piece of the puzzle of Mike to them. Yeah. So when all those pieces get pressed into place, you get a, a, a much more comprehensive view of, you know, more, more elements and facets of his uh, character, his, his existence, yeah. the things he did. So I thank you for that as a friend of Mike's. It's been an, an education for me as well. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, it's great hearing all these people talk about uh, – you know, different competitions or different parts of their career. And, you know, everybody remembers things differently. So it's, it's yeah. great hearing their perspective, you know. Definitely. Yeah. And even just some of the anecdotes of palling around, like Jack Neary, when you had him. Yeah, he was there. great. I, I love talking to him. That's a wealth of information. Yeah, and, and he's such a great storyteller, too. Yeah. And in my opinion, the best writer in, in bodybuilding, bar none. And, that, yeah. and I would include Rick Wayne in that. And I think wow. Rick Wayne wasn't, it was and is an exceptional writer. Yeah, but there was just elements of Jack's writing that uh, uh, it, it just it was effortless the way he did it, and yet it, he painted word pictures that perfectly yeah. captured yeah. You know, things that took place. Yeah, so, it was so it was so great for me to talk to him because right when I got into bodybuilding, that's when he started. He yeah. started writing right around the same time for Muscle Builder. So I, when I started, I was reading all his, 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 his articles and stuff. And funny, like he had funny stuff. If you ever yeah. read his, his article called uh, the thinking man's bodybuilder on Mike Menser. Yeah. Hilarious. It's about them palling around and buying yeah. booze together. And yeah. it was, uh, I think Mike enjoyed it too, because he put it in his very first heavy duty book, which oh, he did. course, which came out in 78 or something or 77. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh jack you know contributed that profile piece on mike for the chorus which was pretty cool yeah yeah he had some great stories about arnold too like when they went to that party in new york <laughs> again yeah that was nuts that was great yeah. that's like it's like the best night of your life you know yeah, yeah. Well, especially given sort of the uh, heights that arnold has ascended to to think you're out driving around with him he pulls yeah. over pulls out a gun <laughs> fires it off in the air like yeah it was so crazy i loved it it was awesome <laughs> yeah, those well, are very funny stories. And that's why you people need to tune into John's podcast. Right? That's right. All right. That's right. Well, John, uh, when I mentioned co having you come on the show, you talked about um, during your, your time in COVID, because uh, we were just talking, you're, you're kind of stuck out there in Canada. The yes, sir. Are so bad, you guys can't really go out much or do anything. No, can't. So, um, you, you kind of put together some uh, audio tapes you had of Mike talking about his life. And you were kind enough to let me listen to them too. So uh, you were able to, uh, I was able to uh, get a good sense of Mike's history through his own words, which was really, really fascinating. Yeah. Well, it, you know, it's interesting. Many years ago, uh, I did a film for Warner Brothers on Bruce Lee. Yeah. It was actually, the first film I ever did, it was called Bruce Lee in his own words. And the, my motive for that was that at the time, which was the late nineties, there were so many people in the martial arts world that were claiming Bruce Lee said this, Bruce Lee said that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, 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 and speaking for him and nobody had a means of going to the source at that yeah. time. And I happen to have 
discovered basically the only what turned out to be his last surviving or only surviving video interview. Wow! Um, really? So, as with that as an anchor and other audio material, I was able to collect uh, and B-roll footage that I, that Warner Brothers provided. Mm -hmm. I was able to put together a film in which it wasn't a very long film; it was about eighteen minutes, in which Bruce Lee told his own story in his own words. Hmm. And uh, his widow, Linda, had told me after she saw it, she said, you know, it was like he was in the room with me. Wow. And that to me was a home run because that's my audience, that one person. If she believed it was authentic, that's all that mattered. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so that hooked me on the concept of in their own words, because if you've ever, you know, brushed shoulders with a celebrity of some stripe, the first thing your friends ask you when you get back is, hey, what's he like? Mm -hmm. you know, what's, this guy, mm -hmm. what's he really like? You know? yeah. And the cool thing about um, putting together a film like that is you can find out for yourself what it was like to spend a half hour or so with this person. Yeah. So, you know, I always wanted to do that with Mike Menser because he was so multifaceted and interesting. Um, but unfortunately, um, A, the the available video footage is almost non-existent. Um, you know, I think Wayne Galosh has some videos that he shot on eight millimeter and super eight. Mm -hmm. um, Way back in the day. Yeah, which, you know, I mean, they're great. They're at least they're records. Yeah, absolutely. But, but the, you know, I remember the Mr. Universe contest that Mike won with a perfect score being broadcast on television, but mm -hmm. nobody knows where it is, where the master tape is now. Yeah, um, I've never seen that either. I, yeah. I've seen, I've seen pictures of like him on the rocks and the CBS television crew is there with the camera, but I've never seen it. Never seen the footage. Yeah. Right. And I remember watching on TV and I had a, a VCR at the time. I didn't know Mike at the time either. I was just a yeah. fan. Yeah. And uh, I was sitting on the couch and I was watching it and I thought, nah, I don't really want to waste the energy to go up and push the cord. <laughs> the fool that I am, you know, but, yeah. uh, and then the same thing with the 79 Olympia, they broadcast that. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't record it. Yeah. But my hope was always that someone wasn't as stupid as I was and that there's a cassette, a VHS somewhere in reasonable quality. Yeah. But anyway, um, what I ended up doing was cutting the audio together so that there is a narrative of Mike's life. Um, and I really just did it for myself. You know, so I have a record of, of, of Mike and I drew it from um, interviews that I had done with Mike over a period of Oh, five or six years. No, geez, it'd be back to 81. So it'd be uh, longer than that, about 10 years, maybe. Wow. Okay. Um, and then um, just prior to his death, our mutual friend, Peter McGuff, mm -hmm. I, I don't know how we got back in touch. We hadn't spoken for about 20 years. And uh, during the course of our conversation, I, I mentioned that I thought his profile on Mike that he originally didn't flex later republished in muscular development mm -hmm. was the best piece on Mike I'd ever seen. Mm. And I knew that he had spent days, like about two, two hours a day for about four or five days straight interviewing Mike. Wow. Because I was in the office and in the Weeder building, there were cubicles. So I was sort of at the back and Julian Schmidt was in front of me. And then Peter McGuff was uh, at the other. Okay. And, and he told me he was going to interview Mike. And I remember lending him my copy of, Jack Neary's contest report of the 80 Olympia because I had that issue of muscle and fitness. Peter yeah. never gave it back <laughs> very much, but um, he interviewed him. And then afterwards, he gave me what he had typed out of the transcript of the interview. So I had that ever since 1995. Okay. But then recently, when I was speaking to him, I said, Hey, listen, I got a kind of a cool thing for Christmas where you convert cassettes to MP3. I'm doing it. Uh, I would love to hear the interviews you did with Mike. Um, and in return, I'll, I'll make MP3s for you and send them to you. So he sent me his tapes. I made the copy, sent them back. And then sadly, Peter passed away like a month after or something. Oh man. Wow. Um, but anyway, I had this, suddenly I had this wealth of Mike Menser audio material. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of it was phone interviews. So the audio quality is not studio by any means. Yeah. But it was enough to allow Mike to tell the story in his own words. So what year um, did he do the one with Peter? I think it was 94 or 95. Okay. And probably it was 90, 94. Cause I think Dorian had just won the 93 Olympia. Okay. 
and he'd won 92 and 93. Right, believe. right. That's and, right, because he does mention that on in the tape, yeah. Yeah, so, and Mike had only been a personal trainer uh, for four years at that point. Started in 1990, okay. and it was 1994. Yeah. So he was coming into his ascendant as a personal trainer, but um, it wasn't, you know, the very end or, or the last, you know, two or three years of his life. It was about 1994. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, I always liked hearing Mike talk, you know, and, and a few uh, few video clips I saw where he is talking, it, it, you know, because he's very well spoken and, you know, he's a very yeah. intelligent guy. So it was great to hear those audio tapes and hear his whole story. He told his whole life story on these tapes. Yeah. That was really great to hear. Well, what you might have appreciated more than most it was his competitive history. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Bodybuilding but, career, yeah. right? Because yeah. as a competitor yourself, you could relate on that mm -hmm. level as well. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, no, he was, <clears throat> as we discussed before, I mean, Mike was a fascinating, multifaceted guy. And uh, he thought about exercise um, steadily and, and deeply. And unlike most bodybuilders who do whatever they do and look the way they do, and that's just the way it is, yeah. uh, um, and that's the end of it, uh, Mike was constantly looking for a better way. How can you trim out the unnecessary and retain the essential? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what, he, that's what he was all about right up until the end of his life. Yeah. Um, and especially when near the end of his life, too, he, um, he was dealing with regular folk, like not the, you know, the genetically blessed. Um, kind of the bodybuilders. Yeah. yeah, or even guys that, uh, that were no stranger to the needle. You know, I mean, yeah. they, he, right. he was dealing with just regular folk that were looking to get stronger and functional and, right. and put on some muscle or lose some fat or whatever. Yeah. So a lot of his um, later um, training was directed toward those people, you know, mm -hmm. as he mentioned, it was what he would call soft core bodybuilding. Yeah. It wasn't, you know, that, uh, uh, and yet by the same token, Dorian Yates did essentially the same program that he put these people on and mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. looked phenomenal in 92 and 93. So yeah. it, it was a valid program. Um, but you know, people, people like me, for example, shouldn't go in there thinking they're going to morph into Dorian Yates. You know, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so Mike was born in 1951, so he's, he's about four years younger than Arnold was. Same year as uh, Lou Ferrigno and I think Danny Padilla, too, so that was a good year for bodybuilding. Hmm. And uh, he was born in Pennsylvania, and one of his earliest influences was his dad, who was, yeah. just, a, who was just a truck driver. His dad wasn't someone who was a very illiterate guy or intelligent guy, but he really got a lot of uh, influence from his dad. Yeah, his dad was a very strong, um, motivating factor in Mike's life. He mm -hmm. was a, a staunch individualist and and a man of integrity. As Mike said, you know, he would he would almost boast about his integrity. You know, yeah. doing the right yeah. thing. Yeah, and um, and it rubbed off on Mike certainly, and Ray, I guess, as well to an extent. Mm -hmm. um, that they should be proud of what they do. They should stand behind their their word. And um, that uh, that you should stand up for what you believe in. That was a big one. Yeah. No matter, no matter what the odds were. And uh, there's a lot of lip service to that. Uh, <clears throat> Mike is one of the few examples I can pull of pull out uh, who actually did it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, even when it cost him. You know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but yeah, his father was a big influence that way. And as he said too, he wasn't he wasn't averse to a fight, but he, you know he wasn't academically oriented or anything but but in terms of principles his father was very principled and, yeah uh, and mike carried that with him throughout his life yeah yeah that's interesting that he said that because uh like you say it sometimes it, it ruins your career when you're like that but you know to to be like that and and be principled your whole life and stick to that well i mean in in some respects it did ruin mike's career you yeah know, after 1980 Right. Uh, when he saw what he perceived as a transgression of ethics mm -hmm. um, and he spoke out about it, um, you know, he got hauled in to the principal's office on a couple of occasions. <laughs> yeah. <a> and, <laughs> yeah. And had his knuckles hit with the ruler a few times, but he still went out in his seminars and said the same thing. And to Mike, though, I remember him saying that, you know, if it can happen at this level, 
it can happen at the lower levels. And, he said, and I get young bodybuilders coming up to me at Golds every day, he said, and they're asking me, oh, should I compete? I don't know. And he said, it's, it's very tough for me to answer those questions. He yeah. said, because, yeah. you know, on some level, there's corruption all the way through. Right. So right. he said, you know, what do I tell these kids? He said, I got to be honest with them. Yeah. And he was. And then once uh, Mike was uh, given two strikes, uh, he was given a third and then he was out. Um, you know, there were no seminars. There was no money. His income dropped from, as I may have mentioned before to you, about 200 to 300,000 a year back in 1979 to zero. Wow. That's so money. That's man. yeah. So, you know, here's a guy that, you know, you think bodybuilding is going to be your salvation and it's a noble enterprise and, and then you see corruption and, and if you say anything about it, you're out. Yeah. You know, and, and so he, like he said, I don't accept this tacit code that isn't bodybuilding. You can never say anything bad against it, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, but anyway, I mean, that would have, that essentially ended his career in professional bodybuilding mm -hmm. in terms of seminar bookings and c competition. He wasn't going, that was his volition. He opted not to compete again, but yeah, the other revenue streams were sealed off. Appearance yeah. in the magazines was sealed off, but you know, in a rare case of sticking to your principles and your guns and ultimately succeeding, mm -hmm. when Dorian Yates came into the scene and started training along the lines of what Mike had advocated and was successful, suddenly there was a renewed interest in what Mike Menser had to say. Yeah. yeah. And then suddenly he was, I mean, his income was right back up to what it was in 79. Right, right. You know, so he, he you know, faced the dragons uh, got scorched, but then came back and slew them, you know, yeah, so it's a, yeah. it has a happy ending in some respect. Yeah, yeah, in a way, yeah. <laughs> so his dad really encouraged Mike in, intellectually, like he, you know, Mike, it seemed like Mike was intellectually just uh, very, he was smart naturally, I guess, and uh, he was really into his reading, and he got good grades at school, and his dad really encouraged that, even though, like I said, his dad wasn't a college student himself or a college graduate, but he, yeah. he, he encouraged that with his sons. Yeah, he, he was very proud um, that Mike had done well academically. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of parents are like that. You want to see your kids do better than yourself. Yeah. And his father knew that, you know, he was driving a truck, probably not by choice, but that's, that's what he had, right? He was, yeah. I think he was in the service. Um, and then when he got out, um, you know, what do you do? Yeah. So he, he ended up driving a truck. I, and I guess he was hard work and blue collar kind of guy. And, mm -hmm. um, but anyway, he was, when Mike started to excel in school, he was very proud, very happy about that. Yeah. And, and he would reward Mike. He, you know, if he got a good mark, he'd give him, you know, as Mike mentioned in the tape, you know, $20 one time, another time he got a baseball mitt. Yeah. Uh, so it was sort of a, a uh, value for value exchange and almost an early uh, presentation of capitalism. Uh, mm -hmm. to Mike that if you do well you work hard you get rewarded yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, and that's what uh, in sort of that became a natural belief of Mike's that if you work hard you should be rewarded yeah and then so, we always you know we always talk about Mike's great genetics for bodybuilding but in the tapes he talked a little bit about how he got into sports a little bit playing around sports and he was really like good like in his high school he was the best uh, athlete for like a couple of years so yeah, you see the yeah I think it was like, yeah, yeah like three or four years back to back. Yeah. Um, plus he was a football player and a swimmer, did well in track. Uh, so yeah, he was a good athlete. And, it, and he was the same way when he was in the Air Force. He was immediately made the, you know, the captain of the physical fitness squad there because of, yeah. his, you know, conditioning and, and natural athletic ability. Yeah, so, didn't, he, didn't he also do like remember they had those superstar competitions he was in that one year right with he Lucifer. was yeah i think it was 81 after the olympia he oh, competed the olympia. in there and yeah. uh just lost the swimming competition by a guy who was um almost a professional swimmer like mm. it was like hundreds of a second difference wow between the two of them yeah it's interesting i remember talking to mike about that it was called the superstars competition yeah <clears throat> and um Lou Ferrigno was in it that year. Yeah. And they did the clean and jerk. Um, yeah. And Mike pressed the same weight, but apparently Mike had broken his elbow at one point. Couldn't quite get the full lockout of that arm. 
Yeah. So we got penalized for that, and Lou won that event. Okay. And uh, then there was an obstacle course and swimming. Yeah. Uh, but he really enjoyed it. He said it was awesome to, you know, to compete against these other athletes. And yeah. At that time, to show them that bodybuilders were, you know, not just, uh, you know, muscle bound or you know unable to do athletic things. In fact, right. he, he damn near won a couple of them. So that was that was pretty impressive. But uh, yeah, I remember Lou also did it. I think in '76, the year after he competed in the Pretoria South Africa Olympia. And incidentally, it's good for third place, too. All right, 270 for Lou Ferrigno. Well, he handled 270 better than he did 260. Yes, he did. He's starting to stagger a little bit, Keith, right now. His timing's a little bit off. He's not getting underneath that weight. And as I said before, to just go on and reiterate, you cannot get that much help from your arms, as gigantic as Ferrigno's arms are. you got to get your technique and get your legs under it. Of course, we see a perfect demonstration right there with all of Right. Now let's spend a moment with Lou Ferrigno's dad, Matt, who's here at the sidelines cheering. Mr. Ferrigno, you must be very proud of this young man, not only for having overcome a real problem, but what he's done. Yes, I am. Uh, I didn't think he would do this good against these great athletes down here. Uh, he certainly gave, uh, has given a good account for himself. As he grew up, was he as dedicated and growing up to succeed as he appears to be now? Oh, yes, in everything he has tried, yes, he, uh, he has a lot of self-discipline and uh, he's a really dedicated worker in everything he's done. And he turned to bodybuilding and he gave it everything he had. And I guess the, his title has shown that. All right, we're at 290 pounds. Oh, he almost lost that. He almost, almost lost that. A little floppy on the second seat. A little floppy. There's a very, very wide... Flip, and he just about caved in with it. Did not really get his legs under it. Bruce Randall, the umpire, has gone over to talk with him now and explain to him exactly how he's going to run into trouble if he doesn't posture himself a little better at the top. See, he almost dropped it, but he stays in at 290 pounds. A break for Lou right there. You think he looks worried? He just absolutely <laughs> cannot play it straight. <laughs> You better get serious right here. That's a lot of weight. Well, I think he's pretty confident about making this one. Oh, yeah. No trouble. Oldfield handles 290 just fine. Bumped himself up just a little bit. First time we've seen him pump. He's a power man. Putting that shot foot, lifting those weights. This is his field. This is his line. The guy who holds it. Here we are, new superstar record, 310 pounds. 310, O'Field held the record at 300. He left that 300 five times. But now we saw Ferrigno almost lose 290. Trying to get his mind together, a, a picture of determination. He's got to be almost perfect right now with the problems he had with the earlier weight, Keith. 310. I don't know if it's good or not. Now, he had the same trouble at 310 he had at 290. He's never really quite froze it at the top. And we're waiting. No, it is not a good lift. No. Rigno is going to finish in second place if Oldfield handles it all right. Yes? Oh, he doesn't do it. Brian Oldfield sets a new superstar weightlifting record, winning at 310 pounds. Oh. And he was downsized, he was thinner, but he, I remember he got a lot of uh, press from that, you know, in the, in the mass media about right. how this bodybuilder did a really good job and he proved that bodybuilders aren't muscle bound. And, you know, I remember Lou did good in quite, quite a few events. I, don't, I forget where he placed. Yeah. Lou was a good athlete. I mean, he was up here in Canada and tried out for the Toronto Argonauts football team in Seattle. Yeah. A lot of people forget about that. Yeah. Yeah, and I, and, and I spoke to a guy that was on the team actually recently about it. He said, you know what? He was pretty good. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why he didn't make the team, but... Um, I think he hurt his last... really tendon or something from what yeah. I remember. Yeah, but uh, he, he impressed a lot of the guys who were at the tryouts. Hmm. So he, he, Lou had good athletic ability as well. Yeah, I think it was after that then he decided, I'm just going to go back to bodybuilding. That was in 77, and then he right. ended up not being able to do the Olympia because uh, the Hulk thing came up, you know. Yeah, yeah, the Hulk was crazy when that came out. And yeah. Everybody watched it. You know, it was oh, yeah. Iron and the Hulk. That was uh, the two things you had to watch. Yeah. 
So when uh, Mike finally got into bodybuilding, he, it was the typical story of, you know, he's in the bookstore and he sees the bodybuilding magazine in the bookstore. Like we've, we've heard a million times from other people. Yeah. And I think, wasn't it Bill Pearl that he saw on the cover? That yeah, was Bill Pearl. Idol. Yeah. Yeah. He saw Bill Pearl. I don't know what year it would have been. Uh, yeah, I think he was like 12 or 13. Yeah. yeah. So he was born in 51. It would have been the early 60s. Yeah. And uh, there's Bill Pearl on the cover. And Mike said it was a love affair right away. As soon as he right. saw it, I, all the other said, sports fell away. You he know? said like he knew exactly that. That's what I, which I could relate to. I remember when I found out what bodybuilding was, I had the same feeling. It was like, that's it. That's what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. You know, what was it for you? Um, what magazine or. Yeah. What was it? A magazine or a TV show or. Uh. I can't remember. Well, I can tell you what magazine I did buy. The first muscle builder was the one Mike was on the cover of. No kidding. Yeah. The one that he talks about in your interview. The yeah. 76 uh, America one or no. Yeah. The, yeah. the one, the, the one that Joe Weider discovered him in 75. Yeah. The Russ Warner shot. There. Yeah. The Russ Warner shot. Exactly. Yeah. That was the first muscle builder. And the first Iron Man I bought was Boyer Co doing his uh, arm pose. Yeah. I think that was from 76 too. So what happened with me was I had, uh, my parents bought me the weight training set because my original inspiration was Bruce Lee. I don't know if I ever told you that. No, but I don't Bruce think you Lee did. Because I was reading comic books. And then um, the first guy I ever saw that had a muscular physique was Bruce Lee. I saw him at a car show. And we went to go see the Batmobile. Because I was a big fan of the, Bat the Batman TV show. Yeah. And they had a, a car show in the Chicago area. And they had the Batmobile there. So I asked my dad if we could go. So we took the whole family. And I think I was probably like 12 years old. And uh, they also had the Black Beauty car from the Green Hornet. And they had a big picture of Bruce Lee saying, in memoriam, Bruce Lee, 1940 to 1973. Yeah. And I was like, who is that? Because I never watched the Green Hornet. I always watched <laughs> Batman. Yeah, so I didn't mean both. Yeah. yeah, so I forgot about Bruce being in the Green Hornet. And I, he was a pitcher from Mentor the Dragon. He was so ripped. I'm like, he guy looks like a real-life superhero, you know, because I was a big yeah. comic book fan. And so I started reading everything about Bruce Lee. And uh, one of the things he said he did was he worked out with weights. So yeah. then my parents, I asked my parents for a weight training set and they bought it for me for Christmas. So I was following the routine that was in there. It was a real basic 10 exercise routine. And right. then I wanted to do more. So I bought like a bench. And uh, then I started going to the health food store and I started looking at the bodybuilding magazines. And then once I discovered what bodybuilding was, I said, that's it. That's what yeah. I want to do, you know? Yeah, I was the same way. Bruce Lee is the one that inspired me to even think about exercise or muscle development or anything yeah like that. yeah and uh, consequently when i discovered the bodybuilding magazines the bodybuilders that i was first that caught my attention and that it um, you know i wanted to emulate were the thinner ones frank zane steve yeah. davis yeah those guys kozo sudo right know, from japan right. um i looked at those physiques and was like yeah it's kind of like bruce i like that it's not too big you know yeah. that was that was a biggie and then uh, and then arnold came out yeah. And of course, we went and saw Pumping Iron. Right. And, and that was it. Arnold was the guy, right? Exactly. And Same his book me, yeah. came out, uh, Education of a Bodybuilder, and that was the Bible. Right. And we, we went, you know, on split routines off to Vic Tanny's or whatever gym we went to. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all times were good. And then actually, I didn't even know about Mike Menser until 79. Mm -hmm. um, moved up to where I am now in, in Muskoka. And there was a guy that, there, I had no weights. The high school had no weights. Um, and I was like, mm, I got to work out. You know, I got <laughs> to do my Arnold program. Right. <laughs> and um, this guy contacted the school and said he was looking for a training partner. And he had, he had a complete weight set up in his basement. Said, oh, okay, wow. I'm your guy. You know, so I went over and he had a poster of Mike Menser up on the wall. And he had ordered Mike's courses. And he had an audio cassette from Mike telling him what to do and all this stuff. Wow. And I was like, eh, you know, Mike, who's he? Mike Benser. Yeah. You know, have you, have you heard of Arnold Schwarzenegger? You know? um, <laughs> so anyway, he, you know, said, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm only going to train this way and blah, blah, blah. I thought, well, you know, it's that or it's nothing. So, okay. Heavy duty. Here we come. You know, and uh, I started doing it and then I read the stuff. And I had a friend in Toronto who was taking uh, physiology. And I'd say, Mike Metzer says this in his course. And he'd say, yeah, that's right. Oh, you know, what about this? Yeah. And I was like, oh, the guy's on to something. You know? So <laughs> then, then I went and saw a seminar. And the rest was 
you know, history. I, you know, Mike yeah. became the guy, you know, and, yeah, then when, yeah. and then when he lost the 80 Olympia, I was, I mean, I wasn't really, I didn't really care about the contest so much. I, I liked the training. I liked the shots of him training rather than mm-hmm. on the stage, mm-hmm. but I knew that what had just happened would now impact my ability to see more of this guy mm-hmm. and learn more from him. Mm-hmm. And so I was, uh, I begrudged um, the IFBB and Arnold and all the people I suspected were wearing black hats in the affair to, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. for what had happened. And then of course I got to know Mike and uh, you know, the, the, the bodybuilding competitive aspect dropped away even further in terms of being relevant because like you and I, we could just sit down and talk, Yeah, you know, and, and he'd tell me what he was thinking about uh, training and what results a certain client had when they did this. And when he backed off on frequency, this happened. It was fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so much so that I remember telling him on numerous occasions, um, why are you still here? Like, why are you in California? You yeah. don't need to be here. Yeah. You know, the bodybuilding thing's kind of, you've, you've moved beyond beyond that. Your name's well established. You could go anywhere. Yeah. And, uh, and do other things as well. You know, you've got this one nailed. You know, you can always do the training, you can do the writing, you can do whatever you want, phone consultations, but do other stuff that you've told me you've always wanted to do, like write a novel or, or do that. Yeah. And um, he said, well, it doesn't have to be either or. You know, he said, I, I like it here. I like it in California. I like mm-hmm. what I do. <laughs> so I mean, I couldn't twist his arm, but I was the Mike Menser in the later stages was um, was sufficient uh, in and of himself t- to me as a friend. He was yeah, he, d- he didn't need to be at three percent body fat or um, competing in the next Mr. Olympia for me to respect him. You know, yeah. Was, yeah. OK. He just had way more to offer. And it was more more fun sometimes when we weren't even talking bodybuilding. Yeah. Like I remember going to his apartment when I moved to California to work for Joe Weider. Um, I went there about a month ahead of my wife and, you know, got the place picked out and everything. Mm-hmm. And that, I had a lot of free time on my hands. So I was I was either going to bookstores or I was going to Mike's place. And, and so we were constantly... Uh, together talking shooting the shit and that's awesome you know blah 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 and tell me about this guy and bodybuilding and you know what about training and what was your most productive routine and yeah yeah um and then it was off to the local liquor store and he introduced me to Grolsch beer you know the one with the the it's got a little like metal uh, hinge on it that pops the top oh yeah 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 i've seen those never had it before (laughs) it's a bottle you know weighs like a bowling ball you know it's not big (laughs) And Mike said, oh, you got to try this stuff. It's great. You know, so yeah. we got a six pack of that, went back to his place. I think we had pizza and, <laughs> and watched a movie. And, and again, just, you know, talking bodybuilding and whatever yeah. we wanted to talk about. It was a great time. Yeah. yeah. I remember you told me about that seminar in Toronto and that was 1980. So you didn't really meet him until the very end of his competitive career. Yeah, I, I met him. I went to two seminars of his. One in 1980 and one in 81. The one in 80 was about six months prior to the Mr. Olympia contest that year. Mm-hmm. And interestingly enough, he was there with Franco and Arnold. Yeah. And they were, the three of them were doing this breakfast seminar. Um, and then it was an, it was November 15th, 1981 was the next one I went to. Okay. So it was a year after the 80 Olympia. Okay. Um, and it was actually just months after the 81 Olympia. Yeah, which I'm sure and you about. Ricky Wayne had written this sort of uh, teaser report on this contest, and he was yeah. just, you know, <laughs> eviscerating the IFBB <laughs> in this piece. And and Mike, of course, was like, "Yeah, yeah, go get him, Ricky." You yeah, know, right. he read the whole piece to us at the at the seminar. It was great. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. But he he just made the point. He said, "You know, this is." He said, "People thought I was." He said, Roy Callender said after the 81 Olympia, he said, I bet Mike Menser and Boyer Co. and Frank Zayner laughing their asses off back mm-hmm. in California. You know, yeah. I told you so. Yeah. And he said, actually, he said, I wasn't laughing. I didn't think it was funny. He said, right. he said, because you look at what could have happened to Tom Platts or Danny Padilla if they had won that contest. Yeah. He said, in Tom's case, he went, would have gone from being obscure to the biggest bodybuilder in the world. Right. But that's, you're talking three or $400,000 a year. 
Yeah. He said, that's a man's livelihood. You're, you're fooling. Yeah. Yeah. And the same with Danny, because Mike, um, as nice as Danny has been in his words about Mike since his passing on your show and other shows, mm -hmm. Mike was equally as complimentary of Danny. Mm -hmm. He thought, you know, in terms of proportion, symmetry, mass, Danny, Danny Padilla was phenomenal. Yeah. Huge, huge. I mean, he would have been in Mike's easy in his top five bodybuilders of all time. Wow. And I did ask him who his top bodybuilders were. And he said, number one was Sergio. No yeah. question. Yeah. Even he said, even ahead of Dorian. Yeah. And number two, which may surprise people, was Arnold. Yeah. He said, you know, all my personal stuff with Arnold aside, he said, I can still objectively assess his physique. He said, Arnold, yeah. he said, Arnold and Sergio were vying for one and two the whole time. Hmm. You know, so he had great, you know, he was a bodybuilding fan himself. So he, he knew who, uh, in his eyes, were the top bodybuilders. Right, right. Yeah, you know, another part of that interview that was really fascinating, John, was, and I, I remember Peter McGuff talking about Mike being at the um, 65 Mr. Olympia, the very first one that Larry Scott won in New York. Yeah. He was, he was still in Pennsylvania, and I guess he was, his dad set him up with uh, a friend of his, right, that was into weight training, and so then Mike yeah. was training with that guy, and then I guess that guy took him to, uh, to the 1965 Olympia, which Mike had to be like 14, right, when he saw that. Yeah. Yeah, it was John Myers and Russell Herzog, and Herzog yeah. was a power lifter. Okay. Myers was a guy who was, he had the gym. He had his, the garage gym that they yeah. trained in Pennsylvania when it was 20 below. Right. Um, but yeah, they took took Mike to his first bodybuilding contest, and it happened to be the very first Mr. Olympia. Jeez, it's unbelievable. Yeah. And I mean, the cool anecdote there is that after the show, he snuck in to the dressing room where Larry Scott and yeah, he climbed, he climbed a fire escape or something and snuck <laughs> yeah. in the dress, he walks into the dressing room and Larry Scott and Dave Draper are there that's great yeah, it just blew his mind you know and yeah. then ended up going down in the elevator with him yeah yeah so imagine being a it'd be like you when you just started bodybuilding and you go into a dressing room and there's Arnold Schwarzenegger right right you know, like, wiping the oil off with a towel unbelievable yeah, yeah. so I mean that was that really drilled it into Mike and then oh, inspired man. And then he went back and he got his latest issue of Muscle Builder and wrote, you know, Mr. Un Mr. America, Mr. Universe, Mr. Olympia, and then the dates that he expected to win those contests. Yeah. Do you He's, remember what those dates were, John? Never saw, well, I never saw the magazine, and I don't think Mike ever uh, indicated to anyone what the precise dates were. But I do know that uh, he said that he, 79 would have been the year that he'd put down to win the Olympia. Okay. Because he wanted to be the guy that won it on his first try. Okay. All right. And so I guess you can back engineer it from there. So yeah. it's probably 79, 78 would have been the universe, which he did win. Which he did, yeah. Yeah. And then 77 probably would have been the America. Right. But he won it the year before. That. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So it's interesting how many perfect scores he amassed. Yeah, uh, yeah. Listening to the tapes, I, I didn't know that he got a perfect score in the prejudging uh, at the 79 Olympia. He got, yeah. I believe he had a perfect score in the 77 universe that he lost to Cal Scholar. Yeah, um, I think you're right. And then Cal won in the post down. Yeah, won in the post down, just like the 79 yeah. uh, Olympia. Yeah, he also got a perfect score in the New York Night of Champions, his second professional show. Okay. He got a perfect score there as well. Hmm. That's not too bad. You know? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> so I was, I was impressed. I hadn't realized there was uh, you know, a, a perfection line going through his, yeah. Uh, what few contests he actually competed. In. So, so when he started competing, I think he was 18 when he did his first show and uh, this was before he ever used steroids and everything, but this just goes to show you the great genetics he had. He oh, wins yeah. this Mr. Lancaster County and he's, like 18. So he's beating all these older guys, full yeah. grown men, and he wins the whole show. And uh, I saw some pictures of that. He looked really good. Yeah. And then yeah. the next year at 19, he goes into Mr. Uh, Pennsylvania, the state title, and he wins that at 19. Yeah. And then he goes to the Teenage America and he gets second place in the Teenage America, but he won a lot of the body part awards. Yeah. And then, and then it was the America that Casey came out of it was his coming out party in yeah that was one case one that the teenage yeah. america though i noticed uh lou ferrigno was in it yeah 
Yeah, and that's right. He was at Lou got like fourth or something. Yeah. 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 No, it was uh it was there was some good bodybuilders back then. And they yeah. looked oh, good. Yeah. Like in the content in the lineup, they looked good. Yeah. You know, like Mike looked phenomenal. Yeah. And that's yeah. wild that he thought enough of himself that he wasn't a teenage Mr. America and he goes, Well, I'm gonna do the Mr. America. So he goes <laughs> into the Mr. America. There were probably like 45 guys in that contest. Yeah. And uh, I think back then, because I talked to Padilla about this too. He said when he started doing the AAU shows, like the America and stuff, it was just one class. Like if you ever look at the results, it's just like they have 40 guys listed. They don't have like a short class, tall class. It's just one class. So Mike got 10th out yeah. of all those guys. And uh, he took second to Casey in the best arms and best legs contest. And of course, Casey, I think, won all the body parts. Just won every body part. Yeah. 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 No, it's uh, that's a, no, no small accomplishment. That's for yeah, sure. Yeah, for 19 years old. It's unbelievable. And that was when he, uh, you know, I guess a week or so later, he, he got the phone call from Arthur Jones. Yeah, which, uh, that yeah. was interesting, too, because I guess Casey recognized Mike's potential. Yeah. And he went up to him and uh, and they and coincidentally, they were the same age, which is pretty wild. You know, yeah. 19 I think Casey old. was a couple months older or something. Yeah, like yeah. And Casey dominates the bodybuilding world. That, that had to be so shocking to see some 19 year old kid. Like yeah. Casey Viator. Well, that's what Mike said too. He said, when this kid stripped off backstage, he said, I went through the roof. Yeah, that looked like, like Mr. Olympia. You if know? you look at the history of bodybuilding, that had to be one of the most groundbreaking events yeah. ever, you know, where a 19 year old kid comes that advanced development and beats everybody in the country. That's yeah. crazy. Oh, and the pictures of Casey there, he was huge. Oh, like, yeah. absolutely yeah. huge. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, Casey, I, I probably never looked as good again in terms in terms of mass and and that's true. Else. That's true because when he came back, you know, in I think seventy eight when he did the Navi Universe, it wasn't that shocking of an impact like that. No, you know, not at all. No, yeah. but like he he looked smaller actually there. He, he was certainly probably more defined as was yeah. the the custom at the time. Yeah, but uh, without the extra mass, he didn't have the, the same impact. Yeah. You know, Boyer Co was kind of like that too. Boyer Co, when he was a teenager, I guess was shocking. I I talked to uh, Ellington Darden, and yeah. Ellington said when he met him at a contest, I think Boyer was like seventeen, and Ellington was like in his early twenties. Yeah, and he's like, this kid was unbelievable. <laughs> like he bench yeah. pressed more than Ellington did, and he said, Boyer Co, you know, Boyer Co is an interesting Boyer's an interesting guy because like Mike in a way, he's always got the antenna for any new thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I remember, well, I remember seeing pictures of Boyer forever, you know, yeah. and the little black and white ones taken in Louisiana or something like that. And his arms were astounding. His back, I know. I his know. back was incredible. Yeah. And always had good legs. Yeah. And um, anyway, I remember we we're coming back from some contest. Um, Might've been one in an Olympia. I think there was an Olympia in Georgia. I'm not mistaken. Atlanta, yeah. Yeah. 93, and, 94. Yeah, and I, I was covering that for Flex. Okay. And Boyer uh, was on the same plane as me going back to California. Okay. And, uh, you know, I was talking to some of the other reporters, and that's the odd bodybuilder, and Boyer comes over and plunks down next to me on the plane. <laughs> and he goes, uh, you, uh, do you rate power factor training? <laughs> Said, yeah. And I thought, well, here it comes. I'm going to get lambasted yeah. by Mr. Pro Bodybuilder, you know? And he goes, oh, that's really interesting. I'd like to get a copy of that, you know? I, I read some of it and blah, blah, blah. And I was thinking, I was looking at him. And then I looked at myself. And I thought, <laughs> what? Are you, why? <laughs> like, why would you need anything, especially yeah. for me? You know? Yeah. Uh, you know, Boyer's, you know, Boyer when he's 90 will still look 100 times better than I do, you know, right. at my present age. So, Anyway, that was Boyer Co. I mean, he was always learning, always, always interested, curious, always yeah. knew right. uh, how he might be able to improve. Um, I, I like Boyer a lot. He was he was very friendly. And, yeah. uh, you know, as you know, that's not always the case in bodybuilding. You know, no, most bodybuilders no. are looking over your shoulder to see who they need to speak to to yeah, right, right. get paid, you know. Yeah, how you doing, John? Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> but uh, Boyer wasn't like that. So. Right, right. And I could see why Mike liked them. You know, they, you know, Boyer was a value for value kind of guy. You know, yeah, he's he's always one of my favorite interviews. I love talking to him, and it's yeah. great now that I kind of know him as a friend too. You know, and I can 
a, a while back, somebody uh, sent me a message and they said, I heard Boyer Co. died. And I'm like, really? So I'm looking on Facebook and stuff. I didn't see that. So then I, I call Boyer on his phone. Yeah. And like 15 minutes later, he calls me back. Hey, John, I'm sorry I couldn't get to the phone. I'm like, well, I just had to call you because somebody said that you died. <laughs> he goes, man, these people, yeah. these people need yeah. something better to talk about than worrying about if I'm dead or not. You know? <laughs> oh, I know. No, and Boyer came up through a very interesting period of time. And as Mike described him, he's a gentleman. You know? Yeah, he and, is. Uh, totally. Um, that's, uh, you know, th there's very few of them around. So it's kind of yeah last of a dying dynasty. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what I like when I interview him. He's just so honest. You know, yeah. he's just so forthright, so honest. And, yeah. and he has great stories because he remembers all the details of what happened. And, you know, even if it goes back 50 years, he still remembers everything, you know. Oh, yeah. No. Yeah. No, nope, he's 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 a good old boy. <laughs> <laughs> so when, when Mike met Casey at the uh, seventy one America, and Casey said you need to, I guess Casey saw the potential in Mike, the genetic potential, and then yeah. he said you need to talk to Arthur Jones. So is that when Mike changed his training then? Because he was doing the traditional six days a week. He was. He was in the gym. He was in the gym. I think he said three hours, three hours a day. Yeah. yeah, six days a week. Right. <clears throat> um. And then he spoke to Arthur and he got, I think he, he came to the theory or to apply the theory of high intensity training as Arthur Jones advanced it by steps. Because like most of us, the muscle magazines were his constant. Yeah. That's this, is what the, this is what his heroes did, right? So yeah. he, was, he was going to do the same thing. But then he damaged his shoulder. He was doing dumbbell flies and, and, and I guess on the way down or something, he did something and mm -hmm. did some severe damage to his shoulder to the point where he couldn't move his arm. Um, so he wasn't able to train, gosh, I think for at least 18 months. Yeah. And then when he came back, that would have, he, I, I'm convinced, I never asked Mike this, but, but based on what he told me the program was, I think it was program that Arthur Jones had written about for Iron Man mm -hmm. was called Some of the Problems and a Few of the Answers. Okay. Ellington Darden purloined it and put it in his advanced bodybuilding book in, okay. in Toto. Okay. Um, but essentially what it was was five or six exercises, two sets each. You, um, and there were compound movements, chins, squats, mm -hmm. overhead presses. And then you did that Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And when the gains slowed down, you cut back to only two such weekly sessions. Okay. And that's what Mike did essentially. So it was like, I think he only did five exercises, two sets each. So 10 sets total twice a week. Okay. And he said, and within a couple of months, he was right back to where he was when he was doing the three hours in the gym thing. Yeah. He's and he started thinking, geez, up. maybe yeah. I could compete again, you know? Yeah. And so knowing that, convinced him that doing less wasn't hurting him it was actually got him to where he was before a lot quicker mm -hmm. um and the volume had been cut down considerably so he came back he went he went to deland florida and trained there actually for a while uh, oh okay with casey so this would have been in Early after time. he got out of the air force so, yeah, he went, he went into the Air Force. How long did he go in the Air Force, John? I think it was three or four years in the Air Force. Okay, okay. Yeah. And and then, when, I was, when I was listening to these tapes, I was wondering if he had such a good physique at such a young age and he took second in Teenage America and then he got 10th in the America, why didn't he just keep going? But then I forgot about the injury. So that's what that's what's kind of side. Yeah. Then he went to the Air Force after that. Yeah, and then he went to school when he got out of the Air Force. But he, he went down to Florida, spent a month or two down there. Okay. And then had to get work. So he went back to Washington. But he was there at the time when they had the unilateral vertical squat machine. You've seen pictures of that? Yeah, yeah. And apparently they had a, a fused foot pedal initially. Okay. So if you weren't real careful with your shoulder pads, it would catapult you right across the gym. Oh, so you come up. <laughs> then they switched it to one leg at a time. Right, right. But, uh, Dave Masteroikis has some letters that Mike wrote him from this period, which he shared with me and in it, Mike has sketched out this vertical squat machine 
says, oh, yeah. I got to try it. This is amazing, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So at that point, he was very interested in Nautilus. When he went back to Maryland, there was the Spartan Health Club, I believe. And that was, they had three or four Nautilus machines and free weights and a Marcy circuit trainer, which is what Bruce Lee had in his home in Hong Kong. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So he trained there. That was his gym, basically. And okay. he started his whole body Nautilus routines at that point. So three days a week, Nautilus equipment. And then he was doing that right up to the Mr. America. And wow. So, okay. and then he was interviewed by Gene Mose afterwards. And Gene Mose couldn't believe that Mike only did, I think at that time, three to five sets of body part. That was the, that was the magazine I got, yeah. Yeah, so that was kind of cool. And then after that, Mike started um, looking into issues like recovery, uh, stress theory, like on Cellier and the GAS, okay, uh, and how that might apply to his training. And that's when he started to, number one, he went to a split routine at that point, instead yeah, of yeah. whole body. Yeah. And he told me the reason for that was he said, I was just too fatigued. He said, doing a whole body workout three days. Yeah. yeah especially the whole time, longer, going to longer. school. Right. But right. there were times he said, I didn't have the energy to get out of a chair. Yeah. Um, so, he cut it in half and he found that the fatigue factor was nowhere near what it was when it was a whole body. Yeah. So that was a plus. So he still did the three days a week. It was just upper, lower, upper, yeah, or etc. You know, yeah. and his sets were still around. I think all of his competitive careers, the sets per muscle group were in and around five, probably. Okay. Yeah. I remember Dorian said the same thing because Dorian was reading Arthur Jones' stuff too. Yeah. And uh, he said he had to, you know, because Arthur Jones believed in the full body workouts, but Arthur Jones wasn't a competitive bodybuilder. So he wasn't yeah. taking into account all aspects of each muscle group, like the rear deltoids or, you know, the hamstring. Yeah. So you had to no, adjust exactly. it and add a little more, a few more exercises and then do a split routine in order for it to be effective. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the whole body routine, I think part of the problem with it, at least from Mike's vantage point, was if you give 100% to failure, which was the way yeah. you train on let's say you're starting with legs which was the nautilus way biggest muscle group to smallest sure. by the time you've gone to failure on leg extensions and leg presses and squats and leg curls and standing calf raises you That's don't have 100 percent left to give to back or chest <laughs> right. or whatever so <clears throat> he just found he could invest more intensity into the exercises for his upper body mm -hmm. if he hadn't done legs ahead of time yeah and, and he and the hole that he dug wasn't nearly as deep to recover from. Yeah, yeah. So that was... It's, a, it's amazing, too, how great his physique was as a teenager doing the traditional six days a week, you know, 25 sets. Oh, yeah. Hour, you know. Yeah, yeah. There's, uh, I mean, again, that was genetics, too, though. But he, yeah. had, he had bumped up against a wall, too. I think his top weight um, when he was doing that might have been in and around 185 pounds, mm, uh, right. maybe 190 yeah um, but you know he he his last competition he was 215 you know yeah. so yeah that's for an advanced bodybuilder which he clearly was even in the early shots to yeah. put on that much more muscle um it, it shows that the something about the training approach he was employing and perhaps even the rest period yeah that he'd been employing yeah um was starting to pay dividends yeah it was a variable that made a difference so when Mike went back into competition in 75, then he chose the IFBB because I think he was influenced by um, Weeders magazine, but also I'm sure by that 1965 Olympia yeah. and getting to see Larry Scott with that massive ovation. And he said when he, when he, I guess, like you said, he, he was in the dressing room with Larry Scott and Dave Draper. And then the security came in and said, you guys got to get out of here. You got to clear the building. So then yeah. he went in the elevator with Larry Scott and Dave Draper yeah. down to the first floor. And then all these fans, you know, like I'm Jerry Branham. We had him on the show and he was talking about they had a hundred people outside screaming like the Beatles, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So he and saw all that and he's like, this is what I want to do, you know? Yeah. And here's uh, Mike Menser, who's a nobody at that point yeah. coming out <laughs> the, the elevator, elevator with the, the champions. <laughs> yeah. so right. It was, it was pretty heady stuff. But because uh, I think back then, I'm sure the AAU was still the bigger contest, but he said, I want to go IFBB. So he did the IFBB um, America where yeah. uh, Robbie won and yeah. Roger Callard was second and Mike was third. Yeah. 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 And he I mean, you can tell, too, from the tapes, the respect he held Robbie. In. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
he really, I mean, he, he, in the conversations we had when Robbie's name came up, he had nothing but good things to say about Robbie Robinson. Right. Right. Yeah. And not just in terms of his physique, which we all know was incredible. Still is actually. Yeah. Yeah. Day. Um, but his character, he liked, he thought Robbie was, you know, a straight up guy, you know? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And I mean, Robbie's got quite a backstory too. I mean, his Vietnam story is yeah, yeah. scary. You I know. know. I mean, he went through a lot, but um, but it was also cool. Like when you notice all these things happening in Mike's life, like Casey coming up to him, and then that's how I got introduced to Arthur Jones. And then while he was at the seventy-five America, Joe Weider was there, and he was yeah. freaked out that the Master Blaster himself was backstage, and Joe Weider was staring at him, and then came up to him and said, you know, basically recognized the potential and then asked him to do a photo shoot that Monday after the contest. And right. that led to his first magazine cover with that Russ Warner photo we were talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the feedback apparently was incredible because yeah. Joe immediately reached out to Mike to get more articles about training from him because yeah. the mail that came in was incredible. And yeah, I, I remember that reading that as a kid and Gene Mose, who did the interview was like, well, you know, he's asking about his training well, how many, uh, what do you do for your chest and stuff? And he's like, well, I do five sets. He goes, yeah. for the exercise? And he goes, no, five sets total. He goes, what? You know, yeah. like, yeah, we're getting a I only train three here. days a week. And <laughs> I only do five sets of body part. And everybody back then was doing 25, 30 sets of body part, you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it was that. And it was a breath of fresh air. And I think even for the fans, uh, people like myself, um, you know, we, I mean, there's nothing we wanted more than to look like those guys. Yeah, yeah that was that was the kid's dream right to, to yeah oh yeah like that. but you know we mike came in at a time when arnold had had the center stage for quite a while mm -hmm. uh, he was the guy and everybody had bought something of arnold's whether it was his courses or went to a seminar or uh, his book when it came out and we all tried to do that in the gym we did as best we could yeah but most of us found that the 20 sets of body part, I mean, we weren't on juice or anything. So obviously we were going to flame out pretty quick, <laughs> right. but we were, you know, we were just like most young teenagers Our the hormonal environment was good that we noticed a difference doing this training after mm -hmm. about two or three months. It's like, sure. but it wasn't a linear process. It was like, Hey, Hey, I think I'm starting it. Oh, it's over. Yeah, and so it was like, damn, you know, like I remember taking a bus downtown Toronto. It took me an hour and a half to get from where I live to the gym and to do that six days a week and, you know, go in there and bust my ass yeah. working out. And yeah. at some point, you know, even I at, at that age said, is it really worth the time? Because, yeah. you know, first couple of months were pretty good, but yeah. uh, I'm not seeing too much right now. <laughs> and then suddenly Mike came in and was saying, well, you don't need to train that off. Yeah. Hello. What? Not only did you not need to train that often, but you'll get better results if you don't train that off. Right. Right. Oh, okay. I'm in, you know, where do I sign up for that? So, so Mike continued then writing articles for Joe after that initial article, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mike, Mike, apart from Rick Wayne, to my knowledge, was the only bodybuilder that wrote his own articles. Hmm. Uh, yeah. All the, I mean, that's why Joe had a staff. Yeah. That's, that's what we did. You know? Right, right. You need Brian Buchanan's arm routine. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, you call Brian and he Get basically gives you, a, gives you a schematic and it's like, okay. And then somebody else writes it, right. Yeah, exactly. Someone else writes it. Even Arnold. I mean, Jack Neary wrote Arnold's courses. I think he wrote yeah. all of these too, he said. Yeah. So um, it's just, you know, their, their thing was bodybuilding. They, right. they, they did it. It's yeah. like the old adage, those that can do, those that can't teach, you know, right. and uh, right. uh, the office was packed with a lot of teachers, you know, because yeah. we, we couldn't yeah. be bodybuilders. Right. So, um, so Mike at this time, then he's after that 75, uh, he still stayed in Washington and he was still going to school and all that. Right. Yeah. Yeah, he was a pre-med program. Training really, really hard that winter, I guess. Him and Ray were training really hard to go into America again. Yeah. I think he realized this is his, this is his shot at fame. Yeah. You know? 
Yeah. yeah. And, and to, to his mind, the Mr. America was the most satisfying contest win he'd ever had. Yeah. 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 I, I remember him telling me that he, before the contest, he would, he would be awake just staring at the ceiling as if it was a movie screen and he could wow. see himself getting the trophy and, and all the hard training and, and, you know, from age 14, the desire to be Mr. America to win it. Yeah. He said the feeling was unbelievable. He said he actually had to fight back tears when he, when he won the, the, the contest. Wow. wow. And he said no other contest, including the 78 universe, which he won with the first and only perfect score, mm -hmm. um, came close to it. He said it was wow. just, it was almost anticlimactic, he said, after the America. Yeah, I remember, the America he, I remember when he said that in the magazines about it after winning that universe about how it being anticlimactic, you know, and I was like, that's a strange thing for someone in that position to say, this guy just won the universe. He's one of the most celebrated bodybuilders right now. Yeah. And he said it was like a feeling of disappointment, but yeah, well, I think that's a feeling that a lot of us can relate to a lot of us who competed, you know? Well, yeah. I mean, you would know better than I on that, but I'm sure there's certain contests that were a rite of passage. Yeah. Yeah. I nailed it. And then other ones were like, yeah, okay, it's nice to have won it, yeah. but it doesn't feel the same as that one did. Yeah, yeah, I think and, in every bodybuilder's career, no matter how far they go, there's that one event. I think I asked Dorian this when I interviewed him, and I think for him it was the, uh, was it the first contest he did? The first real contest he did, I think it was in 1985 in England, mm -hmm. and uh, it was just a novice contest, and the judges were like, what are you doing? And they not, you're way better than you're like one of the best yeah. heavyweights in the country. But for him, I remember asking him this, and this is after he won six Olympias. That that was the most significant victory for him was that first yeah. one because it was the most meaningful and it really felt like you really arrived and you had it, you know. Yeah. I think that's what the America was for Mike. And uh, well, I know yeah. it was because he told me that, but it was it was also the the springboard into big time bodybuilding. You had to win that contest to even be considered yeah. uh, for that. And if you won that contest, you were in. You are part of the club. You yeah. were a champion, right? And, yeah. uh, and in the IFBB, I believe, too, at that point. And how much bigger was he, John? Wasn't he like 17 pounds or 14 pounds heavier than the year before? Uh, I want to think he was... Uh, oh, he, I don't know that he was 200 pounds, but he'd been close to it. Okay. So probably... 198 197 or something so he would have been up i don't know 10 pounds 12 pounds yeah he said 14 pounds i wrote it down 14 pounds there you go yeah, that's crazy yeah well so they would have been 204 wow 14 pounds so that's that's significant that's yeah, a fair that amount is. of mass yeah yeah and that was uh that's i think his next contest after that wasn't it the 77 universe in Nimes? Well, 70, he did the 76 universe in Montreal with Robbie. Montreal. That was yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. That's right. And yeah. Robbie won that one. Yeah. And, and I Mike said he knew Robbie was going to win that one. Yeah. Yeah. As soon as he saw him backstage. Yeah. But he said in the interview that uh, a couple of the guys that were there guest posing, like Lou Ferrigno and Boyer Co., they came up to him afterwards and they said, Man, you really look great. You know, you, you could, you could it win. It's really close between you and Robbie, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It was. But, and, but as Mike said too, you know, I wasn't. He, he wasn't disappointed that he lost to Robbie. Right, right. Um, you know, he said, he said not only did he think he looked better, but he said he, he was already getting the publicity in the magazines. Yeah. You know, so there was, Robbie was a star on the rise. Yeah. And Mike could, Mike was just kind of creeping up into the firmament there at that point. He wasn't. Yeah, Mike had just sort of established his name. When I interviewed Jack Neary, he was, that was the first big contest that Jack covered was that 76 America in New York. And uh, he was really talking a lot about Mike too. He's like, well, that was the one where Mike came out and he was the big name, you know? Yeah. Well, it, it was, uh, it, it, you know, it, he looked good from the photos. Yeah. That yeah. shot of him where the Sartorius muscle is. Revealed. Yeah. Yeah. And, and his abs, he had the small waist, he had the big shoulders, yeah. the square chest. Looked yeah. Great. Like yeah. he looked really, really, really good. Yeah. Um, and he beat a good lineup. He beat Roger Callard. He beat Danny Padilla. You know, he beat yeah. a lot of good guys in that show. Yeah. Well, Mike, you know, Mike had, he, he, he was a complete bodybuilder. I mean, mm -hmm. there, weren't, there weren't really any weak points on his physique. And then I know that's that a lot, not a lot, but certainly the knock on Mike is that he only had his, his pecs weren't very big. Right. But man, I've seen photos where his pecs look huge. Yeah. 
like yeah. huge. The upper peck is every bit the equal of Franco Colombo's. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, and it was like, um, I think there's might be a little bit of nitpickiness going on there. You know, that was, <laughs> you don't, I mean, he truly had, and very few people do, a Mr. Olympia caliber physique. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. there's, there's not many that have it. You know, there's lots that compete for the title and a few that win the title. Yeah. But to actually be up there and not have people go, mm. <laughs> yeah, know, he, that's that's something, you know. Yeah, I've got a, a videotape from Wayne Galash, and it was taken the next year in 1978. And that was, they had a, um, it was the Mr. USA contest, and then they had the pose down for the Amer- or for the universe team. So Danny Padilla was there, even though he wasn't in the Mr. USA. Cal Scalak went in the USA, and he won it easily. They yeah. kind of made Cal go in it because Cal was the 1976 AAU America winner. And they said, well, if you want to come in the IFBB, you got to do an IFBB contest. So then right. he went into that Mr. USA and he, he beat everybody really easily. And then they had the pose down to figure out who was going to be part of the team. So they had Danny there and they had Mike there. And so you're watching, I'm watching this tape and you're seeing guys like, uh, you know, Dave Mastarakis, John Burkholder, uh, maybe Dave, uh, Steve Reed, I think, was another really top oh, amateur. Yeah, yeah, I remember him. Yeah. yeah, yeah, like the top amateurs in the IFBB at the time. Yeah, but then you see Mike, and you're like, "Whoa!" It's like a whole other level. Like when he put his arms up, his yeah. like his body just explodes. You know? <laughs> He's the same thing with Cal. You can say the same thing with Cal and Danny. They were just on another level. They just yeah. oh, definitely, yeah, definitely. Cal, I remember the first cover of Muscle and Fitness that he was on. It was a it was a split cover. Yeah, I remember. And I, I know that he was doing a double bicep on the top one. And yeah, yeah. Those biceps were like, oh man, yeah. Like I'd never seen. Like Arnold had a peak bicep, like Cal's. Yeah. But I remember well, Ar- Arnold only had one. Right. The one, one arm. Was flat, one the other one was a little flatter. Right. And Cal had the two. Yeah. Like, and Robbie does too, actually. Sort of the two peaks. Yeah. And it was yeah. it was stunning when you saw yeah. that photo. Like it just arrested you in your tracks to think. Right. Oh my God, they like they look like cancerous growths. You know? Right, They're right. <laughs> unbelievable. Yeah, but, when I uh, when I was a kid, I was training at a gym, and there was a guy there. His name was Jim Julian, and uh, Jim had spent time in California. He lived in California for like a year. I think it was like 1977, mm-hmm. and that was the year that Cal beat Mike at the Universe. So he said he would train at uh, Gold's Gym, and he would see Cal training there. He said this guy would do 500 pounds on the bench like nothing, yeah. like. Yeah. A, he said it looked like the, the weights were made out of styrofoam. That's how he <laughs> was doing it, you know. But he said when he did a – he would do front squats, and he said his biceps were so big they were almost hitting his head, <laughs> his, his chin, you know. <laughs> his biceps were so massive, you know. Yeah, he was, you know, until his falling out with Joe. Yeah. You know, and, I mean, he didn't have the lower body development to match the upper body. Yeah, right? yeah, I know. But, man, he, he had a very marketable physique, that's mm-hmm. for sure, in yeah. bodybuilding. Yeah. And he was always in shape too. I mean, every show I saw him in, oh, yeah. or I saw the pictures of, he was ripped. You know, he yeah. was shredded for all that size, you know. Yeah. Mike respected Cal too. You know, he said there's no shame in losing to Cal Scout. You know, yeah. So. That's the one thing I liked about those interviews you sent me, John, with Mike, is that he gave respect to everybody. You know, he wasn't like, oh, Cal should, because there was a lot of controversy when Cal beat Mike at that 78 universe. Yeah. I guess Kathy Gelfo, uh, Mike's girlfriend, was really, you know, She's like, he lost a half a body, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. like, you never heard Mike say any disparaging remarks about the guys that beat him. He said, these guys are all great athletes. I'm competing against the best. So, you know, it's, it's no yeah. shame in losing to these guys. Well, even in the um, um, his third professional show, you know, they're interviewing him backstage in uh, New York. Yeah. The guy said, well, you know, the, the competition's really between you and Robinson. He said, no, he goes, these are all, anybody can win this. He said, yeah. they're all great athletes out here. Right. So, and corrected the guy, you know, so that was, but yeah. that was Mike. He was objective. He wasn't doing it to, uh, you know, to be a nice guy or to, or, or to come across in a certain way. It was just, that was, that was the honest call. answer. Yeah. yeah. They, all these guys, are good, you know, and uh, they wouldn't be here if they weren't, you know, right. so it's a competition between all of us. Uh, yeah. So, so that was good. So and that's, that's also what made the his reaction to the 80 Olympia yeah. more meaningful. If he had a compet or a history of grousing after every loss, yeah, then it would be sour grapes. Right. But, oh, here we go again. You know, another right. oh, whose fault is it now, Mike? You know, but that was never the case. Yeah. And yeah. 
in fact, he, all the contests he'd lost in the past, uh, he, he said, essentially, I deserve to lose them. Mm-hmm. You know, and then 80, when that, when that went down, um, he, he never came out and said, I should have won, but he, he said there was corruption. Yeah. And uh, that, that didn't play well. And, and as we talked about, and as Danny Padilla has mentioned too, was I think it was the loss of, almost like the loss of your religious faith for Mike. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because bodybuilding from when he was a kid and saw that magazine, was that was his religion. That was his everything. You know, that was noble, it was pure, it was developing your body to its maximum and, 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 you know, seizing every minute of life to improve yourself, whether mentally or physically and seeing what your potential is as a human being. Yeah. And, and if you really work hard, you, you know, there are these rewards uh, on these staging posts on your journey that will mm-hmm. inspire you to continue the journey. And then, yeah. you know, when you get to the top of the ladder and it's the Wizard of Oz, <laughs> yeah. it's really just a big can of protein powder that's for sale it's like <laughs> what the hell you know? yeah yeah been cl- climbing the wrong ladder yeah so after mike wins at america then john he, he still is in washington right and he doesn't go to california yet, but even though joe joe wanted him to come work for him right right yeah no he wanted to continue in school yeah and i think i think he might have continued in school for quite a while but for the fact that uh he, he just didn't have any money <laughs> yeah, yeah you know he was he was at school every penny was going into school he had a girlfriend he was trying to see he was working part-time for the stress um EKG he, he was studying pre-med right yeah mm-hmm. and uh you know the temptation or the tempting temptation of the offer that joe had made to him come out to california i will pay you a stipend you can yeah. train and you can write articles you can live in sunny Suddenly California. They look pretty good. You know, <laughs> yeah. Suddenly look like that's not a bad deal. So right. I think he went out fairly um, tentatively. But then once he hit California, it was like, yeah, this is where I want to be. Yeah. You know, this is yeah. this is what it's all about. You know, so that that's what he that's what he ended up doing and staying, and he never went back. Yeah. And one of the one of the contests he talked about, which I'm glad he talked about, because this is a contest I rarely have heard anything about. And I never saw any contest coverage. <laughs> But he did a show in 1977, so this was the year after he won the America. He did that North America, which was the IFBB North America, and it was in British Columbia, right? Vancouver, British Columbia. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. Mr. And he North beat uh, Darcy Beckles, who was a great yeah. bodybuilder. Yeah. And there's a, I think there's a picture of Mike where he's just standing, relaxed. You know what I'm talking about? The black and white one. He looks that's the one. Easy. Yeah. Yeah, that's from that show. And they always said it was from the North America. And I'm like, man, yeah. I never saw pictures from that North. That was the only picture I ever saw. Yeah. So he talked about that contest and he talked about how he won that show and uh, looked like a pretty, tank. Yeah. Yeah. And he looked, he must've looked amazing for that contest. He even said in the interview, how great he thought he looked. Second in the 1976 Mr. Universe in Montreal. Look at that back. The winner in the North American Bodybuilding Championship medium class from Washington, D.C., Mike Menser. Also judged to have the best arms and the best legs. Yeah, yeah, he was impressed with it. And yeah, that, that's a very famous photograph of Mike. Yeah, that's one of and, my favorite photos of Mike. Yeah. yeah, and yet there's very few photos from that contest. I know, I know. You know, there was, uh, but I, I do have video that was shot by the CBC um, about the contest. So that's oh, okay. pretty cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I'll shoot you a link. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> but it's uh, it was it was cool to see Mike. He was in great shape. I mean, yeah, he was great shape. Fantastic shape. Yeah. yeah. So that that was uh, that was the last contest he competed in while living on the East Coast. And yeah. He's in North America. Assemble on the stage for the presentations to overall champions. And look who comes out to steal the show. Well, everybody gets into the act. There is the overall champion, Mike Mentzer from Washington, D.C. This award is a... Two tickets to Australia with stopovers in Hawaii and Fiji, Mike. Darcy Beckles of Barbados was second overall, and Dave Dupre was third Just overall. Let me congratulate you on a tremendous championship. Ray Ballou was most muscular. Now the champ. Mr. North America for 1977, Mike Manser of Washington, D.C. And Mike, uh, I understand you're a medical student. Does this help and assist in the development and the understanding of the muscles? Well, certainly a bodybuilder has to have a knowledge of all the muscles, but uh, that's not why it shows medicine, no. <laughs> Did uh, you get into uh, the body development aspects of it because of medicine or vice versa? Well, I got into bodybuilding, and that led to, of course, an intense interest in the body, and uh, it developed, of course, into my present uh, status as a student in medicine. How many hours a day do you have to work to develop a physique like that? Well, most bodybuilders train at least three hours a day, six days a week, but I only train a total of three hours a week. Okay, what do you do during those hours? Train very hard. What type of training? Working mainly on weights? Yeah, barbells, dumbbells, so forth. What's the most you lift? Uh, about 1,200 pounds. Let's see you flex those muscles one more time. Just a nice close-up shot here for that arm development. Now, let's see. Let's, let's compare. No, I'll put mine behind you and you'll cover the whole thing. <laughs> okay, Mike, what are you going to do in the future now? Obviously, you've got a very heavy schedule with the medical studies. Uh, what are you going to do as far as uh, bodybuilding is concerned? Uh, well, the two are starting to conflict, so one of these days I'll have to make a decision, either bodybuilding or medicine. Okay, now some people are obviously going to ask, after you give up bodybuilding, what happens to the muscles? Do they begin to sag? No, not at all, as long as you... Uh tailor your diet to your activity need demands, uh, your muscles just shrink and atrophy back to normal size. Mike Matzer, congratulations, a tremendous development and a tremendous accomplishment, Mr. North America for 1977. This is Don Whitman reporting from the championships in Vancouver. California thereafter. Yeah. So then right after that, he goes to California. He starts working for Joe and he's in the magazines all the time. And then yeah. he's the favorite to win the universe that year, which is in uh, Nimes, France. Right. And that's the one we were talking about where he went up against Cal and then Cal beat him in that controversial. And I, like you said, John, I forgot he did score a 300 perfect score yeah. in the prejudging. And yeah. then at the night show, they kind of disregarded the prejudging scores and they judged it on a, on a placement system. And I think Cal, or uh, yeah, Cal won by one vote over Mike. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So that was that was an eye opener for Mike. He he actually said, you know, Cal was in better shape. You know, yeah, really. Um, it was great that he got a perfect score and everything, but yeah. he didn't. I don't think he would have felt right. He would have been accepted, of course, but I don't think he would have felt right if he'd won it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, Mike was better balanced, but I think Cal was in better condition. More yeah, he was harder for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, but Mike knew that was the wake up call that if he yeah. didn't get his act together and win the universe in 78, that he could kiss his bodybuilding career goodbye. Right. He had two losses already now at the universe. He lost to Robbie and then he lost to Cal. So. And he said, you know, the judges don't forget that. Right. Oh, right. yeah. You're the guy who got third place. Yeah. yeah. I remember. yeah. So. Um, Anyway, he, he did, and he won the, the universe the next year in El Capulco with, with a perfect score, which carried over into the finals. Um, and that, that represented probably the peak of his uh, competitive career. 
because everything started to happen all together at once at that point. You know, yeah, yeah. By I think by '79, he had a poster, he had a book deal, a two book yeah. deal. Yeah. Um, he was appearing on television shows to promote the book, like Merv Griffin, Mike Douglas. That's wild. Um, That's he was great. in GQ magazine. Wow. Uh, so I mean, next to Arnold, no bodybuilder had that kind of exposure. So right. His star was like Zoom. And Arnold was retired at this point. So it was yeah. Mike that was in the magazines. Mike was the next upcoming guy, right? Mike was the guy, yeah. yeah. And and uh, he had a, I don't know if it ever equaled Arnold's following, probably not, but he had a big following. Like, like yeah. Oh, he yeah. had very loyal people that were very much uh, supporting him and bought anything that Mike put out, would go to his seminars, you know. Um, yeah. And and he was he was very popular. He was... He was the anti Arnold, and it's and it's just human nature. If someone has it, you know, too good for too long, there's a Schadenfreude. You know, there's a, a resentment. Yeah, you, you want to see him taken down a notch. Yeah, we see it with the Mister Olympia guys all the time. All the time, and I, I think there's a bit of that with Arnold. You know, yeah. like everyone loved him. He was very charismatic and and tremendous physique, but it was Arnold every month in the magazines yeah. Arnold, 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 Arnold. Yeah. And then if it wasn't an article praising him or an article by him um, about his whatever calf routine, uh, it was about his contest that he and Jim Warmer were promoting the Mr. Right. Right. And then you turn the page and there he is selling, you know, weeder mega shakes or whatever <laughs> the hell Joe was hawking at the time. Right. You couldn't get away from him. It was, yeah. You know, 50 pages of any magazine was Arnold. Yeah. And anyone who was interviewed praised him. Yeah. So it was Arnold, 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 Arnold. And then out of left field comes this guy with a perfect score in the Mr. Universe contest who's training three times a week for 30 minutes a pop. Yeah. He says, you know, if, uh, if Arnold's methods worked and everybody uses Arnold's methods, why aren't there more Arnold Schwarzeneggers running around? Right, which was Mike. <laughs> that was the alarm, right? This is who is this guy? What? But uh, so people liked that breath of fresh air that came in. Mm -hmm. It was a guy that wasn't towing the line. He wasn't kowtowing to Arnold, lighting candles at his shrine. He was. Right, right. He was thinking for himself, and he seemed to be a formidable person to want to engage in a debate uh, about training. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, he got a lot of respect. And then when word started to come into the magazines that it pissed Arnold off, well, that was all the more reason to get behind Mike, right? Because yeah. <laughs> he, yeah, he, he was an intelligent guy. He was good looking. He you know, yeah. looked great in photographs. Plus, he had the great physique. Yeah, now he was having a great career. Yeah. So you could see Arnold, uh, you know, getting a little jealous of that, you know. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, and, and in fairness to Arnold, I mean, he he couldn't have anticipated how well he was going to be received. Right. But when you do and you have it good, you don't like anything that's going to disrupt the way things are going. Yeah. And when you start getting questions, well, you know, Mike Menser says I don't need to train as it's like, well, who is this guy? You know, yeah, right, right. You get out of here. You know, there was <laughs> and so there was that. And he he didn't like uh, uh he didn't like Mike. Uh he didn't like uh the fact that Mike was not saying, Oh, Arnold's anything he says about training is sacred scripture right but saying quite the opposite you know question everything including what arnold says and yeah yeah that didn't that didn't play very well with arnold and his group also so, uh now that you might be bringing that up john I, I forgot that story he said about the 76 america he said every judge there gave him first place except arnold really? <laughs> and arnold gave roger kellard who was his training partner, training partner yeah place. yeah absolutely and that kind of reminded me when I did the interview with Danny Padilla, he said, uh, I, Arnold, I don't think Arnold was a judge that year, but uh, Roger was um, favored to win. And then Danny came in from New York a couple of weeks before the contest and he's all, doesn't even have a tan. He's chewing gum at the prejudging <laughs> and he ends up beating uh, a Roger Callard. And then they, he goes in the back and he's showering and then they make him come back and they go, we got to do the post down over again. Cause yeah. Roger, Roger's <laughs> protesting. <laughs> I know. Yeah. You've got to find some way to get this guy a victory because right, uh, right. Danny dominated. Right, right. Yeah, well, I remember Mike um, saying that one of his friends was at the contest that he uh, won, but that Arnold didn't vote for him. And when Callard came off the stage, Arnold said, Menser just blew your shit away. 
That's what he said while he was pissed wow. at Ballard. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Even though he didn't vote for him. Right. He still yeah. recognized that there was a problem. So. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, it's funny, you know, I mean, the Arnold Mike thing is a very interesting dynamic because he was his hero mm -hmm. at one point, just because he was a bodybuilding fan. Right. So yeah. Arnold was the guy and they did seminars together at George Snyder's and yeah. Albert yeah. Busick flew him over to Germany and Arnold and he were together there. And, hmm. Um, but you know, Mike said, I, I never said anything bad about him as a person. Just, so I, I just disagreed with the training approach. Yeah. You know, right. and, um, but that was, you know, in, in bodybuilding and in, <clears throat> in the bodybuilding industry, that's business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, if, you, if you came on your podcast and said, every book John Little wrote is a piece of shit <laughs> and, uh, you know, you're going to end up looking like a jockey. Uh, that hurts my business. You know? right, so right. If someone said, hey, what do you get John Hanson? Well, I'm not my favorite guy right now, but I mean, that's that's just the nature of it, right? Right, right. Um, so there was that that Arnold didn't like about Mike uh, because he was the only bodybuilder that wasn't basically training by ritual, doing what they did because Arnold did it. And Arnold did what he did because Reg Park did it. You know, yeah, and on yeah. and on and on. Yeah, yeah. He's a guy that thought for himself and figured out he didn't need to train that much, didn't, got good results, and shared the fact that I got good results not doing what this yeah. guy is doing. Yeah.